Okay. And if we could start with, oh, here we go. And we'll start right ahead. Uh, first, let me issue a warning that I'm going to show you more uh, graphical data in the next 12 minutes than I'm sure you're going to want to hear or see. But I do it for a reason, because I would like you to see the basis upon which I'm drawing many of my conclusions. And if you would like to uh, look at these in greater detail rather than the, the quick glimpse that you'll see of them, uh, I'd be happy to send you a copy of all of the slides that I'm going to be using with explanatory material. So with that in mind, the topic is the cause of the pause and predicting future climates. So first of all, we want to know what the pause is. Uh, the pause is really a misnomer because it implies that there was a continued period of warming that has now paused or been interrupted, and that simply is not the case. A better name might be a temperature reversal, uh, and in these cases, uh, perhaps global cooling. The climate hasn't changed, as you know, in, in almost 18 years, and so that's what we call the pause. But here it is, whoops, sorry. This is what most people would regard as the beginning of global warming, about 1978, which is the first time that uh, CO2 and the temperature were going up at the same time. And that uh, increase um, ended, as we know now, about 18 years ago, but roughly around the turn of the century. And this is what is now known as the pause, that is the period of, of uh, interruption of, of the global warming that took place between 1978 and, and 1998. But it's not the first pause or temperature reversal. There are lots of others. Uh, 1850 to 1880, there was a, a warming period, a very similar one from uh, about 1915 to 1945. And then the one which is referred to as the modern global warming from 1978 to about the turn of the century roughly. These are all almost identical in terms of the intensity of the warming. And they were interrupted by periods of global cooling, which are um, known as, as pauses. Uh, I prefer to think of them as, as periods of, of cooling rather than uh, as uh, pauses. Oh, let me go back one more. Uh, let me point out that, that this century is in no way unique because we have had, um, oops, sorry, during the past 500 years, at least 20 periods of such warming interrupted by 20 periods of global cooling. This is from the Greenland ice core. These are oxygen isotopes. Um, red peaks are temperature highs. Blues are temperature lows. And um, of these 20 periods of warming and cooling, the average interval is 27 years. And I'll come back to why that uh, may or may not uh, have some significance. One of the things you may not know is that for the past, oh, I keep hitting the wrong, sorry. For the past 10,000 years, except for the little ice age in here, the temperature has been two and a half to five and a half degrees warmer than present. Now this is Greenland, this is not global temperature. But two and a half to five degrees warmer than present, and we have been uh, here in the little ice age, and we're now just thawing out from this, but we've got two and a half to five degrees to go before we get back to what was normal for most of the past 10,000 years. So what we're seeing now in the way of warming is nothing new and it is, is, is not actually uh, a very large intensity. So what's the cause of the so-called pauses? Uh, in 1999, I was doing some work on glaciers uh, and this is a chart that shows that glaciers were advancing and here glaciers were retreating and I happened to read a paper at about three in the morning uh, which had the Pacific Decadal Oscillation uh, data on it, and this is it right here. And I thought, oh my gosh, the PDO here was cool, and all the glaciers advanced. The PDA, PDO was warm here, and the glaciers retreated. I thought, my gosh, that must be a connection. So I said, I wonder if this has any relationship to global temperature. And so I plotted global temperature, in the same, um, same time frame here. And sure enough, PDO cool, glaciers advancing, global climate cool. PDO warm, glaciers retreating, 
and the global climate warming. So, aha, there must be some cause and uh, effect relationship here. And so it looks as though there is a direct connection and perhaps we can use the pattern of past um, changes in the, in the PDO to uh, look into the future. So each time the PDO is cold, this is what's happening in the Pacific Ocean. This is the, the cool mode from 45 to 77. Here's the warm mode from 77 to, to 98, and that's represented um, right here. And so we looked at correlation with temperatures in various places, and Joe DeLeo put this graph together. The PDO plus the Atlantic equivalent of that plotted against Arctic mean temperature makes a really nice fit. Shows there is a relationship between these oceanic temperatures and uh, temperatures in the Arctic. Same thing is true of European alpine glaciers. Um, the blue is the uh, alpine glacier advance and retreat. The red is the uh, Atlantic uh, oscillation. Uh, and you can see there's a, a very nice um, correlation there. So what this suggested was that, gosh, Glacier fluctuations are caused by climate changes, which are caused uh, by changes in the PDO. And I shouldn't say caused by, I should say correlated with, because we don't know the uh, direct connection very well yet. And then the question becomes, what drives these, these particular modes? So I thought we can use this as a predictive tool. We can use the pattern of past climate changes and past PDO changes and see what's going to happen in the future if this same pattern continues. And so the question is, what's in store for the next 30 years? Global cooling, global warming, um, statement made by uh, a uh, spokesman for Al Gore, actually said those words. So in order to um, predict where we're heading, we need to know where we've been. And in that extent then, the past is really the key to the future. And if we can establish a well-defined pattern of warming and cooling, perhaps we can project that pattern uh, into the future and allow us to make some statement about uh, what's in store for us. So in order to measure past warming and cooling events, we can use historic temperature measurements, oxygen isotope ratios in deep ice cores, advance and retreat of glaciers, and measurement of ocean temperatures, and there are others also. So here is the PDO, and as you'll see, here's a cool PDO from about 1945 to 1977, which is reflected in the global temperature. Here's the warming period from 1977 to about 1998, and lately uh, we flipped into a cool mode. So what does that tell us about um, the uh, possibility for predicting future climates? Well, it's a simple exercise to say, okay, we have flipped now into the cool mode of the PDO in 1999. So what if it was the same as the last time the PDA, PDO turned cold? What would that look like? So we simply cut this out and paste it in over here and say, okay, if history repeats itself like it has for the entire century and like it has for the past 500 years, then this is what we ought to expect from the PDO. If the PDL looks like this, what's that mean for global temperature? Well, here's global temperature. This is uh, Hadcrut uh, 3, I think, which I don't particularly like, but at least it shows the trend. And here's that same cool period here. So if we do the same thing here and transpose that here, we ought to have global cooling beginning about 2000. So in 1999, the year after the second warmest year recorded in the United States, at least, I made the bold prediction that global warming is over. I published it here in 2000, 2010. And I said the current warm cycle should end in the next few years and global warming should abate rather than increase in the coming decades. I published that in 2000. And in 2006, I published um, uh, the current warm cycle should end and global temperatures uh, should cool. Bearing in mind that this was the year after a very hot year, everybody thought it was crazy. And that may or may not be true, but uh, let's look at what that might mean. How much cooler? And the, the answer to that is we have no idea. 
But there are several possible scenarios. One is like the last cooling period here, fairly um, gentle cooling, not much, like the 1880 to 1915 cooling period, or like the Dalton, which was even deeper, 1790 to, um, to 1820. This is the one that, that got Napoleon in Russia. Or the Maunder, which is a really deep one um, from 1850 to uh, about 1700. So which of those is the more likely? We don't know. Time will tell. But we have 15 years since I made this prediction to test that hypothesis and see where we are. And it's kind of like my intent to live forever. So far, so good. Uh, <laughs> and time will tell whether it stays that way. For the past decade, we have uh, slight global cooling. Uh, not a lot, but um, certainly uh, definite cooling. And we can look at the trends. Um, here is the, the CONUS trend, just recently published a couple of days ago, that shows in the U.S. also uh, a slight cooling, not a lot. But the trends are interesting. The 10-year trend is slightly negative, slight cooling, past 10 years. The last five years, it seems to be uh, becoming more intense. Whether that continues or not, um, we don't, don't really know. Uh, but time will tell. Winters uh, in the uh, United States have gotten colder. Uh, this is from Joe DeLeo. In the central U.S. over, the, over this decade, uh, they're about eight to nine degrees uh, colder than, um, the, um, uh, than the average. Along the coast, it's not so much as anywhere between one and about uh, three to five degrees. So uh, it is, in fact, uh, apparently uh, cooling. So in summary for, for this part, um, we have a consistent pattern of warming and cooling. It's been going on for a long time. The pattern uh, of cooling can be projected into the future, and we, if we project that same pattern, we have then a basis for making some, some qualitative um, suggestions for uh, climate change. The pattern of warming and cooling matches warm and cool periods of the PDO, and is clearly related to the PDO and the AMO also. Uh, the projection of past uh, climate patterns into the future, uh, combined with the fact that PDO turned cold in 1999, led to my, my 2000 predictions of cooler going climates in the next several decades. So far, prediction of global cooling uh, seems to be indeed happening. But what about the cause of the pause or the cause of this reversal? What's driving it? Honest answer, we don't know. Uh, but there's some interesting things that uh, are apparent by looking at the relationship of the sun, and in particular, the correlation of global climate to sunspot number, solar insulation, TSI, solar magnetism, cosmic ray intensity, production rates of beryllium-10 and carbon-14, which are a measure of, of cosmic ray uh, intensity. So the off-sided example of um, these relationships uh, begins with uh, the Maunder minimum, during which time there were virtually no sunspots, uh, a well-known, well-accepted relationship between sunspot number and global temperature. This is the CET, uh, the, the Central England uh, temperature record, plotted against the time of the, of the Maunder. And the Maunder began about 1650, plus or minus a couple years, ended about 1700, plus or minus a couple years. And the temperature during that time, as you can see, went steadily downward uh, during that entire period. There are other periods where a similar relationship exists. The um, Dalton and the cool period from 1880 and these younger cool periods are all characterized by low sunspots. And going through these quickly, the same is true of TSI, cooling and lower uh, TSI, which is probably an indicator rather than a cause. So I'm going to skip through a couple of these in the interest of time. Look at solar magnetic flux. Um, we have low solar magnetic flux during the Dalton uh, and the, uh, the Maunder. And this has resulted in a change in the production rates of beryllium-10 and carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere. A very good correlation between beryllium-10 as a measure of cosmic ray incidence uh, and, the, and the CET uh, in England. Good correlation between 
beryllium concentration and sunspot number and good correlation between production of beryllium-10 and carbon-14. They seem to be dancing together. So I'm going to skip through these. Where does this get us? Um, I'm going to skip that. This gets us really to the Svensmark hypothesis where lower field magnetic strength of the sun results in fewer sunspots, um, lower TSI, more galactic cosmic rays, Low-level cloud formation as a result of ionization in the upper atmosphere, more sunlight reflected from the clouds that are produced, and the Earth becomes uh, colder. This is widely known as the, um, the Svensmark uh, hypothesis. So here are some conclusions, um, and the, the basic one that uh, I'd like you to, to go away with uh, is that I am continuing to predict global cooling for the next couple of decades at least, uh, and uh, all I can say is that um, time will tell whether or not uh, I'm correct or not, and Mother Nature will be the ultimate judge. So my next goal is uh, to live another 30 years to see if my predictions are correct, and I'm working on that right now. Thank you. Thank you.